Welcome to another exciting edition of Business Law. And today we're going to talk about everyone's favorite topic, personal property. And this is a really crucial topic because no matter what kind of business you go into, you are definitely going to need to know some of the basics of personal property. And today we're actually gonna talk about a few things that you probably never heard of before in your life. And that is a bailment. That's right, something that you've done many times in your life. In fact, one of the earliest legal transactions that you ever entered into, even as a small child, was a bailment. And you didn't even know what that was until today. So we're gonna have lots of great things to delve into today. Personal property, bailments, and then a little bit about insurance before it's all said and done. So let's jump right in. First, we look at personal property, and today we're gonna to talk about the nature of personal property, how ownership can be acquired to items, and then how it can be given to others. We're gonna look at the nature of a gift and exactly what is required for a true gift. And then we're gonna look at what happens when you lose property, and ultimately when someone else finds it, what kind of ownership rights do they have? And so let's jump in on talking about personal property. Now, the first thing to understand is that property consists of a whole collection of legal protections and rights. And there is a big difference between real property and personal property. In fact, in business law, we really look at three different kinds of property, don't we? We looked at intellectual property, trademarks, copyrights, patents, those kinds of things. They're really not tangible, but they are reproducible and they do have a value. And so we call them property, but they're really called intellectual property. We also have personal property and then real property. And so real estate or realty, and we are actually gonna cover real estate in the next chapter. And so let's differentiate those two for just a minute. Personal property is anything that you can pick up and physically move. And so it doesn't exist in the space of what we talked about before about intellectual property. It is tangible, it is real, and it exists, right? But it's not physically attached to land. If something is physically and permanently affixed to the land, then it actually at that point is considered part of the real estate. And so real estate includes not only the land itself, that is the ground, but also any improvements to the land, which would be like landscaping, uh, ferns and trees and grass and all of those kinds of features. If you put in a nice little creek in your yard, uh, you know, a little goldfish pond, that's part of the land now. The goldfish, not so much, but the pond itself, yes, that counts as real estate. Even the building, so the house or the office building that you put on the land, that's part of the real estate. So personal property is everything else, everything in between. And so if you can pick it up and move it, then that's probably gonna fall into some kind of category of personal property that we're talking about today. So what do we mean when we say ownership of personal property? Well, the, the classic example in business law is to look at ownership as a bundle of rights. And so we give you the imagery of a bundle of sticks, right? It's a bunch of individual sticks all kind of wrapped together and if you have them all, then we say you own something, okay? And so what are these individual sticks? What do we mean by that? Well, one individual stick would be the right to possess the land or the personal property in this particular case, the stuff. Another stick might be the right to sell it. And you say, well, wait a minute, if I have the right to possess it, don't I have the right to sell it? No, not necessarily. And we'll look at some distinctions between those two the right to give it away, the right to lease it, the right, that is the right to rent it, and even the right to destroy personal property. That's right, you have the right as an American to destroy that personal property if you want to, and nobody can tell you otherwise, unless that personal property happens to be alive, uh, like an animal or something like that, then we might have a few things to say about that. But you have those rights, and so if you own them all, then we say, well, that's a certain kind of ownership, and if you own only some of them, then we might say something like, well, you're just leasing that property. So for example, a renter, do they have the right to possess their apartment, right? Or in this case with personal property, we'll use the example of an automobile, right? Uh, you are renting an automobile. Do you have the right to possess it? Certainly. Do you own it? 
Mm, no, we would say, no, you don't own it. Well, strictly speaking, legally, you do own the right to possess it. And so we would say you have one of the sticks, but not really the whole entire bundle. And so do you have the right to destroy it? No, absolutely not. And so it's possible to own some of the sticks without owning all of them. And if that's the case, then we say that that's something less than full ownership. Now, there is a, a specific title for owning the entire bundle, and we call it fee simple, fee simple. Now, I don't know why. I don't know why it's called fee simple. I don't know why that's the law, what, what it calls it, but that's the name of that kind of ownership. So if you own the entire bundle, the maximum level of rights, then you are said to own something in fee simple. All right, okay, I can go along with that. Uh, in fact, we're gonna see this again in the next chapter when we talk about owning real estate. And we're gonna say that if you own real estate at the highest level, you own it in fee, simple, absolute. And you'll remember that because it is absolutely the highest level of ownership that you can have. So fee simple is the highest, the max. And by the way, if you just sell something to someone, the default, the assumption is that you are giving it to them in fee simple. Now, how can we acquire ownership other than purchase? Because we understand we can buy something. Are there other ways that we could acquire legal ownership of something? Well, certainly. And there, there are some things that you can legally own simply because you possess them. You acquire possession. You say, wait a minute, I thought possession was only one of the sticks. Well, that's true, unless it's a certain kind of personal property. For example, wild animals. If you capture a wild animal legally uh, on legal land and so forth, then you actually now own that thing. And wild animals are assumed to be owned by no one until they are captured. So if you were to go out west, I've done this, I've uh, traveled a little bit. And one day I was uh, staying in a hotel and I looked out back and it was completely undeveloped, just prairie land. I don't know if it was Nebraska or somewhere out like that. And I look out and I saw a whole entire group of horses, like a herd of horses. What, what would you call an entire group of horses? I don't know, somebody can comment about that. But uh, they were Mustangs. And I asked the lady at the desk, down, down at the desk when I checked out, I said, did you see that pack of horses? And she said, uh, uh, yeah, they're around here all the time. Those are wild Mustangs. I said, who owns those? She says, nobody. And she was right. Now, if I was to run out there and be very foolish with like a, a rope or probably like a bungee cord I found in my car and try to you know, grab one of those Mustangs and say, okay, you're mine. I'm going to take you home now and I'll call you George or whatever. I named my Mustang. What's the appropriate, what's the appropriate name for a Mustang? I don't know. You could tell me that too. But uh, if I was to say, okay, George, you're mine now and just start walking home with this Mustang, you're telling me I could just do that? Yes. And uh, in fact, that's legally exactly where it's at. So if you find abandoned property, and what we're going to find out in the next chapter is there's even a way to legally steal someone's land called adverse possession. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next chapter. Another way you can own something is by producing it. Write it yourself. Invent it. Manufacture it. Uh, if you create something, let's say I was to go and 3D print something. Well, then I own that. That's mine. I made it. Now let's talk a little bit about gifts because this is one category that's a little bit different. Normally, when we talk about a contract, we say that it must, uh, it must follow that in order for this contract to be offer acceptance, we then have to have something called consideration. And that is that the party who is receiving the item of value must give something of value in exchange for that. And if they don't, then it's just a gift. Okay, and we, we've always said that. We said that in six chapters in contract law in law one, didn't we? We talked about, well, then that's just a gift. Well, what's so bad about a gift? Is there any point at which a gift is complete? In other words, the giver can no longer come back to the givee, I guess, and ask them to return that item to them legally demand that they give it back and say, well, hey, you know, I know I meant to give you that, but now I'm taking it back. Is there a point where the law would say, no, sorry, giver, you can no longer do that. You do not have the right to take that back. Well, again, the answer is yes. 
but there are three specific elements that must be met in order for the gift to be completed. The first is delivery, delivery. So when you're giving a gift to someone, you cannot merely state an intention to someday in the future give them a gift. If you do, completely unenforceable for the most part. All right, just like with most things, I have to say it depends. But for the most part, a statement of a future intent to give a gift, a true gift, is unenforceable. Even if you have a videotape of that person saying it in the most sincere terms, doesn't matter. Does not matter. If they didn't give it, if they didn't deliver the item to you, then their intention to give a gift doesn't matter. By the way, this comes up a lot in estate cases. And so there was a case in your book, you should definitely read this highlight, it's a huge case called In Re St uh, Estate of Piper. And in this case, you had someone who uh, was elderly, an older lady, and she had someone that was taking care of her. And this person who was taking care of her uh, was promised by the lady that uh, she was um, that, that she wanted to give her her diamond ring. And so the problem was she never actually gave her the diamond ring. And instead, she just said she intended to give her the diamond ring. And with that being the case, uh, when she passed away, her will said everything goes to the deadbeat kids, right? The ones who were never around, the one that this lady was always talking bad about, but she never changed her will. And so the kids said, nope, we get the diamond rings. And the caretaker said, no, I get the diamond rings. And the judge said, well, let me ask you this lady, did she ever actually deliver the diamond ring to you? And she said, no, she maintained it in her possession during her lifetime. And the judge said, well, then I'm sorry, I don't disagree. I don't, I'm not calling you a liar. I'm sure she did intend to give that to you, but she did not actually give that to you because she never delivered it. So there must be deliver. Now, delivery can be constructive. So if I was to take my car keys and throw them to you and say, here, I wanted to give you my car. Whoa, you say, that's quite a gift, Dr. Davis, a 2005 Nissan Murano. I mean, that's a classic automobile. And I would say, well, hey, you know, uh, only, only you, my favorite student. And I throw you my key to my car. And then later I say, hey, hey, I, give, me that, give me that key back because that's my car. And you say, I'm sorry, sir, you gave that to me. Well, who's right and who's wrong? I didn't actually pick up my car and give it to you, right? So did I deliver it? Well, constructive delivery says you have to give some token of ownership, including something like the keys to something. So if it was constructive delivery, that counts. And so at that point, we would have to say, as long as the other elements are met, that this gift is complete. And so that is a true gift. Now, the second element is that there must have been donative intent, donative intent. That means the intent to be a donor, okay? Um, that, that there was not only delivery, but it wasn't just me throwing you the keys and saying, hey, would you mind going to park my car? I left it on the curb running and I'm gonna get a ticket. So if you wouldn't mind moving that over to the parking lot, I'd really appreciate it, thanks, great. Okay, now if I do that to you, did I intend to permanently give you my car? No, I'm just asking you to do me a favor, which we're gonna, by the way, find out is a bailment in about five minutes. And uh, the truth is I never really had any intention of permanently giving you my car. So that's the second element. There has to be an intention on the part of the donor to give a gift. Notice this is intent of the donor, not the intent of the donee. All right, so just because you intended to receive a gift doesn't mean that that satisfies this element. And then thirdly, it has to be accepted by the donee. So all day long, I can stand here holding out the keys to my car, but there's no gift completed until you actually take the keys and receive the gift. And there have been plenty of cases where the donee never does actually go in and accept the gift until it's too late, and then at that point, the gift is ne was never completed. And so there must be acceptance by the donee in order for that gift to be complete. So delivery, intent, and acceptance. Those are the three requirements for a legal gift. 
Now, let's talk for a minute, changing gears, talk about lost property, lost property. The sad day that you've lost something. You ever lose something important? Uh, this ring is, this is my college class ring. It's actually the second one. Uh, the first one I got was stolen. I know, that's sad. While I was in law school, of all places. And I don't know why somebody would want a Maranatha Baptist Bible College class ring, but somebody wanted it worse than I did, I guess. So they got it, and I made an insurance claim, and I got number two. All right, so there we go. That's a precursor to the insurance talk that we're going to have. But let, you, ever, you ever lost anything important? I, I lost this ring once for a year. And then later on, I was getting ready to renovate the basement, and I lifted up a chair, and it fell out of the chair. I used to sit in that chair all the time, and then I, when I put it in the basement, evidently it <laughs> It's fallen off my hand, gone down in the cushions, and when I picked up that chair, it fell out, and I went, ah, I found my ring. Uh, one time, I was driving from Atlanta back to my home in Danville, Illinois, and I was a uh, uh, getting ready to be a, a freshman in college. I had just graduated from high school. I was working in Atlanta that summer, and it was hot. It was a, a hot July day. I was going home to visit my family, and I'm going to tell you this story, and I want you to figure out amongst these three possibilities which one my lost item would classify itself as. All right, so, so be looking at these and figure out which one my lost item was. So I was uh, driving home, and I'm driving through Tennessee. Now, if you ever drove through Tennessee on this particular stretch of interstate, there's a really hilly part that goes through the mountains, and then it's pretty flat, and then you get all the way to the northwest side of the state, and, uh, and so I had, uh, I got all the way to the northwest side of the state and I, I was out of gas, completely out of gas in my uh, 1984 Ford Escort station wagon, stick shift, brown, all right, very, very sleek automobile. All the ladies loved it, not at all. And I got all completely out of gas and I pull up to the gas pump just on fumes and I go to get my wallet and it's gone. You gotta be kidding me. Where is my wallet? I just had it. I, I had it, oh, oh no, what have I done? And so at that time there were no cell phones. So I went over the pay phone. I had the, I had the calling card memorized. It's about a 850 digit number that you had to put in. Called my dad and I said, dad, I'm standing in a pay phone in the middle of a parking lot at a gas station in somewhere in Tennessee. And uh, I don't know, I have my wallet. I don't know what to do. I'm out of gas and I don't know I have my wallet. And I was getting just kind of emotional. My dad said, well, what's the phone number on this pay phone? So I'm like, all right. So I tell him the phone number on the pay phone. He says, okay, wait right there. I'll find it and we'll figure out what to do. My dad's amazing. He can find anything. So I sat there in the baking sun in that July afternoon for about an hour. And then the phone rang, the pay phone rang. I mean, I'm sitting there questioning all my life choices. And the phone rang, and it's my dad. <laughs> I mean, how do you answer a payphone that's ringing, by the way? Um, hello? And he says, Matt, it's your dad. Oh, thank you. Oh, okay. He says, I found your wallet. How in the world? Well, sure enough, I had stopped at a rest stop or a, a, an exit, right? Just as I got into Tennessee, before the mountains, three and a half hours before in my story. And I'd gone into a, a McDonald's. He says, evidently, you went into a McDonald's. I said, uh, yes, sir. I guess I did. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. And he says, well, you left your wallet in the men's room on the counter next to the sink. A state trooper walked into the bathroom after you left, found your wallet and gave it to the manager. It's in the safe at the McDonald's. How in the world did my dad do that? He, he was amazing. We used to have the FBI, the Family Bureau of Investigation. And I was convinced growing up, I could pull nothing over on my father because he was going to figure it out. Like God just told him stuff, right, about anything I did. And this was just the nail in the coffin for that theory. And I said, you know what? That's exactly what's going on. So he says, I'm going to wire you some money. You go to the Kroger's. It's about a block away. Can you make it there on, your, on fumes? Yes, sir. Go to the Kroger's. I'm going to wire you some money. Get, get that cash, fill up your tank, drive back to McDonald's, get your wallet, and then drive the rest of the way home. So it was about a seven hour detour out of the way to go there and back and get my wallet and drive the rest of the way home with that sunburn in my non-air conditioned 1984 Ford Escort. So let me ask you this question. What kind of lost property was my wallet? Hmm. Well, say so that's a good story, but uh, let's look here. We got a few options, all right? Option number one, mislaid property. 
This is where you voluntarily put something down somewhere. In other words, you intended to place it there, but then you left it there inadvertently, right? You forgot about it and left it there where you put it, but now you're gone. Okay, that's theory number one. Theory number two is lost property. In this situation, the circumstances of where the property is at indicates that this person involuntarily left it there and has probably no idea where it was ever lost and maybe no intention of coming back or ever finding it again. And then the third possibility is abandoned, which means they intentionally gave it up and don't intend to ever come back and get it. It's trash to them, right? So which one would you say my wallet was as it was sitting on the counter in the men's room at a McDonald's, all right? Well, obviously the answer is mislaid property. Now, why does it matter? Well, it matters because the finder gets different rights of ownership depending on which kind of lost property it really was. So in the case of mislaid property, it's obvious this person put that there because wallets don't fall out of people's pockets and land on the counter, right? If it was on the floor or if it was on the side of the road, like, you know, I wildly turned and it went swooshing out of the, off the dashboard into the median, right? Then, then we might say, oh, that's lost because the circumstances indicated just fell here by accident. But if it's placed somewhere that things are normally placed, why would you suppose we treat that differently? Well, the answer is because that person is probably going to come back to that place when they realize it's gone and think back and remember where they left it. There's a famous episode of the Cosby show where Vanessa loses her homework. And so, you know, Mr. Huxtable goes all through the house retracing her steps. And then what did you do? And then what did you do? And I mean, she's taking them all through the house after school. She did this, this, and this. And she says, I don't know, dad, then I got some ice cream. And he says, okay, so he opens the freezer and he goes, aha, and he finds her homework in the freezer, right? Well, homework doesn't just slip out of your backpack and end up in the freezer, okay? So the idea is by the circumstances, we can tell this person is probably gonna come back and probably going to come looking for this item. And so the finder is in that situation, not the owner. He doesn't acquire ownership. He becomes a steward. So the manager of that McDonald's, when the trooper gave him or her my um, wallet, did not become the owner of my wallet. They became the steward. So they put it in the safe, they locked it up, and they were waiting for me to return. Now, luckily it was a wallet, so they could just <laughs> look at the driver's license. Uh, yep, that's you, okay, here you go, thanks. And of course, yes, I did buy a shake or whatever. And, you know, I don't remember if I gave them any money for their trouble, but they were very nice and they laughed at me like they, you expect that they would. So that's mislaid property. Lost property, again, inadvertently placed there. The circumstances indicate this person is never coming back. The finder becomes the owner. The finder becomes the owner. Against everybody in the whole world, except the original owner. So if it's truly just lost property, the owner still gets a chance to come back and say to the finder, uh, wait a minute, I can prove that that is mine and the finder has to give it back to him. But nobody else, nobody else. He can treat everybody else in the world like he owns it, except for the original owner. And then with abandoned property, even the original owner has no more claim. So once you put garbage down at the, end of the, at the end of your driveway, then somebody else can go through it and claim it. You know, one man's trash is another man's treasure, right? And so that's abandoned property. If the circumstances indicate that it was abandoned, intentionally discarded, then anybody who wants it can have it. And, you know, other than like local ordinances that might say, please don't go rummaging through people's trash, uh, that's the way it goes. So down in my neighborhood, Anything you put down on the corner is like free game. And I have just laughed because no matter what I put down there, within like a half an hour, some guy in a pickup truck will come by and scarf that thing up. Well, broken down dresser, 
boom, 10 minutes, you know, it's gone. Tiny little bike, gone. You know, uh, broken uh, battery powered scooters, absolutely. You know, and so there's nothing that they have, I've tried to put things down there that nobody would take. And so far it all gets taken. And so that's fine. It's abandoned. Now that person owns it. Good luck. All right, so that's lost property in a nutshell. Mislaid, lost, abandoned, okay? All right, let's switch gears now and talk about this new concept of bailments, bailments. I mean, in addition to being a new concept, it's kind of fun to say, right? I mean, bailments. What is this all about? Well, we're gonna look at the elements of a bailment, some rights and duties, and then some special types of bailment. So you've been doing this since you were small even though you didn't know that this is what you were doing. Anytime you borrowed something to play with, to use, whatever, anytime you borrow something, you are experiencing a bailment. Congratulations, good job, you did it. Yay, you did it. Uh, a bailment is just borrowing something, okay? Or loaning something to someone, or, um, asking someone to watch something, that would be a bailment, or asking someone to store something for you, that's a bailment. And so let's look at what the legal elements really are. A, le a legal bailment is formed when an item of personal property is delivered to someone else, but not ownership. So we are asking them to hold on to this thing, but they don't own the thing, okay? So it's a kind of an important distinction here that they are, they have possession, but they do not have ownership, okay? So the idea is when the bailment is over, the bailee has to return the property back to the bailor, okay? Or to a third party that, that they might direct. Now, a, a good example of this is a warehouse, right? A third party warehouse or a grain storage bin, the co-op where the farmer does his harvesting and then he takes it over to the co-op and they put it up in the silo, he gets a little ticket, right? And his ticket is a bailment ticket. And it says, my grain is now stored in that silo and I have X number of bushels of beans or corn or whatever it is. So that's the basics of what a bailment is all about. So the elements are, we have to have personal property. You can't do, you can't do a bailment with a person. Okay, so when, uh, now, it, it, I admit, nurseries at the church, it kind of looks like a bailment. I mean, you're giving them a little baby and they're giving you a little ticket and they're saying, okay, after the service, you bring the ticket back, we'll give you a baby. Um, hopefully the same baby or similar, all right? And, uh, you know, close enough, I guess, is the, the point. But uh, that's not a bailment because you can't bail people. Come on, that we don't do that in America, all right? That's unconstitutional. And so... Uh, no, it has to be for property, for stuff, not for people and not for real estate. So you can't do a bailment for real estate. It has to be personal property. There has to be delivery of possession. Again, it can be constructive possession like the keys or title or something like that. Uh, it has to be given to them. They have to knowingly accept it, right? You can't like set your... Uh, Let's say I needed somebody to watch over. What are we going to have them watch over? Um, I'm leaving the country and I need you to watch my dog. Is a dog, by the way, personal property? Yes. Yes, it is. Uh, or a monkey or a tiger. All right. They're all, all those animals are personal property. So if I wanted, I needed you to dog sit for me. And uh, I just came quietly over to your house. This is a little creepy. Uh, while you were taking a nap. And I just took the dog's leash and like quietly laid it on your forehead. All right. You're asleep. And, and I lay the leash on your forehead and I just quietly. And then I leave a note saying, thanks for watching my dog. All right. I'll be back in a month. Love Dr. Davis. Okay. And I leave the note there and you say, wait a minute, I didn't agree to this. Right. So there can't be a bailment, right? Is dog sitting a bailment under normal circumstances? Yes. All right, that would be an example of a bailment. Hey, will you watch my dog? Sure, now we have an agreement, okay? And so that's really the third element. There has to be some kind of acceptance, knowing acceptance, and then agreement either expressed or implied by the circumstances. Once we have all three elements, then we got a bailment. An ordinary bailment could be classified in three different ways. 
a bailment for the sole benefit of the bailor, a bailment for the sole benefit of the bailee, or the mutual benefit bailment for both parties. You say, what in the world is this? Okay, <sighs> let me see if I, if I can explain it this way. A bailment for the sole benefit of the bailor is where you might say, hey, will you watch this for me? And I'm not going to pay you to do it, so you're volunteering, and you're not going to get to really get much use out of it while you're doing this, okay? So in that situation, um, I'm asking you to watch over something for me, but you're not getting anything out of it. Have you ever been in the airport and somebody is sitting in the air? This has happened to me like a dozen times in my life. I'm just sitting there minding my own business. I don't know why this happens to me. It happens to me all the time. And someone will say, hey, what? We're not supposed to talk to strangers, but I'll be like, what? Would you mind watching my bags? I have to go to the bathroom. What's the deal with that? Like, you're not supposed to do that in the airport. People do this to me all the time. So if I say no, no bailment. But if I say, um, yeah, I, I guess, sure. By the way, I never remember what that person looks like. Like, just humanly speaking. I, <laughs> so it could be anybody comes back. But, but uh, I, uh, okay, you know, what are you going to say? They're like putting you on the spot. Am I getting anything out of this? Evidently not, right? So this is a good example of a bailment for the sole benefit of the bailor. They're going to the bathroom. I'm watching their stuff. They're not offering to pay me anything. I'm not getting anything. I'm not rifling through their things saying, oh, look at this. They got some peanuts or whatever. Uh, no, totally for their benefit. This is called a gratuitous bailment and I have the lowest duty of care possible, right? The only thing I can be liable for is gross negligence. That means like I intentionally get up and start going through their stuff and giving it to people. Or, <laughs> then, then I could be liable. But if it's just like, oh, somebody, they, the real person comes back and I go, uh-oh. And they say, what do you mean? I say, well, to be honest with you, I didn't remember what you look like. And somebody that, now that I think about it, doesn't really look like you at all, but I thought might look like you came and took it. And I thought it was you but I was, it was a mistake, but it was an ordinary mistake, not a gross mistake. You know what? I'm not going to be liable because that's not gross negligence. That's just ordinary negligence. Doesn't rise to the high level of gross negligence. I should be fine. Okay. Now airport security won't be so happy with me or them for that matter, but uh, bailment of the sole benefit of the bailee, uh, bail are very low level of care due and very high level of negligence required to win in a lawsuit. Second category, bailment for the sole benefit of the bailee. This is where the person who is receiving the item is getting the benefit out of it. Well, how is that gonna work? I go over to my neighbor, or I know what's happening. I'm trying to mow my lawn and my, my lawn mower just gives up the ghost. This has happened to me twice, okay? My lawnmower just quits and my neighbor is sitting over there. He's got a beautiful, nice lawn and, and he looks over and he says, oh, your lawnmower just quit. Yeah. Hey, listen, would you mind if I borrowed yours? My lawn is half cut. I'm going to look like an idiot if I uh, leave it like this while I'm waiting on my lawnmower to get repaired. So would you mind if I borrow your lawnmower to finish my lawn? And he says, uh, yeah, sure. So I'm not paying him for this right? Is there any kind of legal relationship that exists here? Aha, yes. A bailment for the sole benefit of the bailee this time around. He's not getting anything out of me borrowing his lawnmower, but I am. So in this instance, I have to, I owe him a very high level of care, right? It's his lawnmower. I need to be very careful with it. I shouldn't be running over rocks like my kids are always doing. I shouldn't be like, tipping it up or doing whatever other kind of dis disabling the safety mechanisms or things you're not supposed to do with lawnmowers, right? So I have a high standard of care that I owe him. And at that point, I'm liable even for slight negligence, right? Basically, if, if I do anything to his per item of personal property, I'm going to have to pay him for that loss, okay? So that's the bailment for the sole benefit of the bailee. Possibility number three, mutual benefit bailment. This is by far the most common because what this is, is I'm paying you to either be the bailor or paying you to be the bailee. 
So in this instance, I might say, listen, uh, neighbor, can I rent your lawnmower for 50 bucks? Sure. I'm giving him $50, so he's benefiting. He's giving me a lawnmower, so I'm benefiting. Mutual benefit. What is the standard? Well, in that case, we each owe each other a reasonable duty of care and standard negligence rules will apply. So those are your three types of ordinary bailments. Now there are, added on top of that, some special bailments, and I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this other than to tell you the things they told us in law school at a high level. Common carriers, we've talked about these a number of times in our contracts law sections. A common carrier is somebody like UPS, FedEx, okay, a company whose job it is to deliver stuff, personal property. Common carriers have a very high level of care that is, re, that is due and required for how they treat the stuff, okay? And so uh, if you think about a movie like Castaway where F Tom Hanks and the FedEx plane go down in the ocean and uh, all those FedEx packages are spread all across the Indian or Pacific or Southern or whatever ocean that happened to be. Well, who's liable for that crash? FedEx, okay, why? Because here's the rule you need to know. Basically, if a common carrier has anything at all happen to the stuff while it's in transit, they're liable. Stick it to them, okay? Absolutely stick it to the common carrier. If there's a test question and it says, a common carrier, blah, 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 are they liable? Yes, okay? I don't care what else is in the question. Common carrier, something happened, stick it to them. All right, easy enough. Everything in the middle is just fluff. Don't even need to know, why? Because it says strictly liable, strictly liable. That means I don't need to know the reason why. I don't need to know any excuse you had. You're liable, pay. Now I give you in here a couple of things that are exceptions like act of God, act of the public enemy. I mean, some far-fetched stuff like, what if a pandemic breaks out, blah, 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 as if that's ever gonna happen, okay? so. You know, a couple of really unrealistic things in here that we're finding out might not be so unrealistic. But uh, common carrier, stick it to them. Warehouses, reasonable duty of care. Uh, they can't exculpate. You say, what is that word? Did you misspell something? That looks misspelled, Dr. Davis. I'm pretty sure you misspelled something. No, exculpate. That means you can't completely eliminate the liability. So why don't you just put eliminate? Because I put exculpate and that's the legal word that you use. You're gonna sound a lot smarter in life if you just learn this terminology, all right? So exculpate, and then you can't lose an argument if you use the word exculpate, all right? So just learn it and use it. Learn it, love it, live it, all right? So you can't completely eliminate liability, but you can limit the liability, limit it. Innkeepers, that is a motel, hotel. All right, by the way, what is the difference between a hotel and a motel? I feel like they should have taught us that in high school or something. Uh, but anyway, innkeeper, uh, if, if you give them your valuables to put into the safe of the hotel and then it gets lost or it gets stolen, then they owe you. Okay, but the parking areas and the common areas, not necessarily. Uh, so that's why there's a lot of legalese. You ever look at the back of the door in a hotel room? Like there's all this legalese. This is the kind of stuff they're trying to weasel out of. Okay, so innkeepers have a very high level, strict liability over the things that you leave in the hotel. And then they try to always exculpate themselves. They can't, but they can limit the liability. All right, okay, that's bailments in a nutshell, okay? Now we're gonna switch gears and talk about insurance, insurance. And we're gonna look at some of the terminology. We'll look at something called an insurable interest. And then we'll look at just a little bit at the insurance contract, all right? So insurance is a contractual agreement for transferring or allocating risk, risk, okay? So the important concept of insurance is risk. That's why what commonly is referred to as health insurance these days is really not insurance at all. Uh, when you talk about single payer health insurance and the government should take over this and that, um, it's really not insurance if it covers everything. 
Okay, because why? Because we're at that level not even talking about risk anymore. We're talking about certainty, okay? So what is risk? Risk is a prediction, a mathematical prediction about the possibility, the potential of a loss of money based on known and unknown factors, okay? So risk involves some kind of potential loss due to uncertainty and unknown. And so in business, the one thing we hate, remember the hallmark of an excellent legal system is predictability. Did you say it out loud? You better have said it out loud. Predictability. So what does business hate? What does the economy hate? The economy hates unpredictability. That's why we have something called risk management risk management, which means, listen, we hate this uncertainty. We hate this unpredict unpredictability. So what we'll do is we'll pay a little bit of money to prevent a big loss. That's what insurance is. I'm paying the insurance company a little bit of money all the time so that I can manage my exposure to a really large risk down the road. So it involves the management and transfer of that risk of a really big claim onto the insurance company instead of being on me as a company or an individual, all right? So what do we have to know about? Well, you need to know the policy. That's just a name for the insurance contract. The premium, that's what you pay to the insurance company on a regular basis to have this policy. The underwriter, that's the name of the company that is actually going to pay if there is a covered claim. And then we're gonna look at the difference between a broker and an agent. Now, let me just stop here for a minute because this is super important to know just from a consumer standpoint, all right? There is a big difference between an insurance broker and an insurance agent. And you've got to know when you're having the conversation, which one you're actually dealing with. Because if you're dealing with a broker, they cannot speak for the company. They are not an agent of the company, so they can't make promises. Everything they say to you about what's covered and what's not covered by a particular policy is non-binding. And you're like reading this thing and you're going, wait a minute, I don't understand this. What, what even does this mean? And they say, well, it means this. And, this. and you say, well, let me ask you this. If, if, if I lose all the data uh, from my server and I have a huge business catastrophe, will I be covered for that? And the broker says, oh yeah, you'll be covered. That opinion is non-binding on the insurance company. If on the other hand, you are dealing with an insurance agent that works for the company that you are actually buying the insurance from, then their opinion about what is or is not covered by a policy could actually be something that you rely upon. You would be foolish to rely upon the opinion of a broker. Now, brokers have a place. They are very valuable, in fact, because a broker is not tied to one company, right? You say to them, this is the kind of insurance I want, and this is how much I can pay, and this is how much I want in coverage. They will go out and they will shop around to lots of different companies and find you a, a policy that fits, okay? So I worked, I've worked a lot with brokers. I've worked a lot with agents. They both have their place. The key here is no which one you're dealing with. That's super important, that you've got to know which one you're actually dealing with. So, in order to get insurance on something, you have to have an insurable interest. Now again, we talked about insurable interest when we talked about the idea of ownership, when we talked about risk, when we talked about uh, title back under the UCC. The Uniform Commercial Code Article 2 talks about insurable interest. Now, what does that mean? You can't buy insurance on something you have no rights in. And this is important because we don't wanna give people an incentive to collect on an insurance policy by destroying something that they have no financial stake in. And so whether that's a person's life or whether that's property, you have to have some kind of legal connection to that thing before you can buy insurance that covers it. And so you can't buy fire insurance on your neighbor's house, 
Otherwise, you would kind of have a motive to burn down their house, wouldn't you? Because, hey, you don't live there, so what's the big deal, right? And so that's what we mean by insurable interest. You can insure anything you want as long as you have an insurable interest in that person or in that thing, okay? The contract is governed primarily by contract law. That's the high level thing that you need to know about that. The application is not the contract. In the law, the application is actually, kind of reverse thinking here, the application is actually considered an offer by the insured person to the insurance company asking them, hey, will you cover me, all right? And so because we consider that to be an application, if you lie on it, then the insurance company finds out later that you lied, they can actually undo the whole entire contract because they say, wait a minute, our acceptance was based upon your warranty, your promise, that you were a non-smoker or that you were uh, didn't have these pre-existing conditions or whatever the case might be. So there must be consideration and the parties have to have capacity. But other than that, it's a basic contract law that applies to the, the relationship itself. The application, you kind of just fill it in, you attach it to the policy and it becomes part of the contract. Anything you say that is a misstatement or a misrepresentation can actually void the policy, except there is such a thing, and most states have this, that say after a particular period of time, then the insurance company can no longer go back and quibble over things that you said in the application that turn out not to be true. Now, the reason for this is that they have been accepting your premiums for years now without questioning, without investigating, without making any kind of different statement. And now they're gonna come back and say, oh, I'm sorry, now that you're actually needing the coverage, we're gonna void your policy. It's sort of a basic fairness thing, right? That after a certain number of years, usually it's two years, that at that point, they can't go back and look at the application and void the contract. So that's usually a state statute, not necessarily a clause that is in the contract itself. There is, of course, the insured can at any time cancel his insurance. Uh, these cases are interesting because usually they're, they're, you say, why would it be a case? Well, it's a case when the person phones in their cancellation and then like, let's say you're driving down the road and you, you shouldn't do this. You're driving down the road and you're, you're on the phone with your insurance agent. And you say, yeah, I want to cancel my car insurance. Oh, okay, what's your policy number? You give it to them and you say, okay, we're all good. Yep, we're good. And then you hang up and get in an accident right away because you were stupid and talking on your phone. Um, and then you want to say, well, wait a minute, uh, that didn't go through, right? Like I had till close of business today or like the end of the month. <laughs> the, the thing is on cancellations, the minute you cancel that policy, they are off the hook at that point immediately. And they will refund you back a portion of the month and say, here's your premium for that three days at the end of the month, you are not covered those three days. Because the minute somebody cancels their insurance, you are off, okay? Now, the insurer, if they want to cancel you, they've got to give you written notice. There, there's a good faith requirement that they have to go through. And the bottom line is, I used to do these cases all the time in Illinois where the insurance company wouldn't pay for something that was very, very clearly covered under the policy. And so we would threaten them with a bad faith action because insurance companies, they're very, very good at doing one thing and that is collecting money, okay? What they really don't like to do is pay money out, okay? So somehow the two departments, if they could like take all the people that work in the money coming in department and put them over in the money going out department, that'd be great, but that's just not how it works. So they're very, very slow and hesitant and very conservative when it comes to actually paying claims. And if you've ever worked with a company, you probably know what I'm talking about. So we would threaten them with bad faith actions and then they would cough it up because most states say if an insurance company in bad faith denies a claim, then they have to pay out like two and a half or three times the amount plus attorney's fees for the bad faith action. And so they really don't want to get hammered with that particular penalty. 
So again, insurance, that's a very high level on lots of different kinds of insurance. At Maranatha, we have, I think, 27 different kinds of insurance that we have. Our, our coverage map that shows all the different ways that we're covered and umbrellas and all those different things. We're not really getting into all that, but just a basic overview of insurance. So again, action-packed episode of Business Law. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a great day.